Welcome to the Benzo Free Podcast, your home for an honest, straightforward, and personal discussion about anti-anxiety drugs, their effects, and how to deal with dependence and withdrawal. Whether you have taken benzodiazepines, Z drugs, or any other tranquilizers, know someone who has, or you just want help dealing with chronic anxiety and insomnia, this is your podcast. I'm your host, D.E. Foster, author of the book, Benzo Free, The World of Anti-Anxiety Drugs and the Reality of Withdrawal. I'm so glad you joined us today. Please stick around and let me bend your ear for a few minutes. It just might feel a little better on the other side. Hello there, this is Dee and welcome to episode 55 of the Benzo Free Podcast. You know, I wanted to pull something from the news today. Yes, I know what some of you are saying, but you don't watch the news. <laughs> no, I don't. That is true. Well, for the most part. I do have one news feed on my phone right now. Only one. <laughs> and it's American football, <laughs> the NFL. As you know, my Chiefs are in the Super Bowl and they play this weekend. Have, have I mentioned that already? <laughs> anyway, that's the only news feed I get. But it was through this news feed that I learned about Kobe Bryant. I, I saw the news alert come through yesterday. Now, I'm not a basketball fan, and I can't say I followed his career either. But I know his name, and I've even had the chance to see him play, and, and he was great. And for all those who mourn his loss this week, and the loss of his daughter and all those on the helicopter which crashed, I mourn with you. But this story got me thinking about heroes. Heroes are those larger than life, who we look up to and inspire us, who make us want to do more, to be more, to, to never give up. Now, I'm not normally a fan of this term, hero, to be honest. I, I think it has something to do with my inherent skeptic, but it does seem to me like the term hero is thrown around a lot these days. And once we put someone on that pedestal, we're also just as eager to tear them down again. I guess it's just human nature, but it does leave a hole, and it leaves us without that person to help lead us. Still, hero is a term that many of us use for those who we look up to. And when they move on, they remain in our memories and in our hearts. While Kobe may not have been my hero, I did have some. One in particular, who we lost quite recently to brain cancer. Some of you may have heard of him, many of you have not, and that's okay. His name was Neil Peart. He was a lyricist and drummer for the rock band Rush. I would sit at my drum kit when I was a kid, in my parents' basement, every afternoon, dreaming of being Neil Peart. He was my hero. To a young drummer, he was a god. The best rock drummer of his generation, hands down in my opinion and he wrote some pretty amazing lyrics too. I was just grateful that I had had someone to look up to. I was this stocky, red-headed, freckle-faced, awkward kid in high school. I was what many called a geek, or more specifically, a band geek. Although that's probably not PC today, it's what I was. I didn't fit in with the popular kids. They wouldn't even talk to me. But in junior high and high school, I fit into one place, and that was in band. When I was in high school and later in college, Rush gave me something to strive to and drum solos to dream about. Every time the band came in town, I went to the concert, and Neil, well, he never let me down. You see, we all need heroes, someone and something to believe in. We need someone to lift us up, someone to tell us we can make it, someone to say, I made it, and so can you. In Benzo Withdrawal, we need heroes more than ever. Professor Ashton is a hero to many, including myself. She left a light on to guide all of us, through her work, through her research, and through her manual. But there are others, too. 
those who have been through what we are going through, the, the ones who went through the trials and came out the other side to live that happy, healthy life we all want back. In the Benzo community, we often refer to these heroes as success stories. But that doesn't dilute their value. They are heroes nonetheless. And even more so than most of the celebrities who we often attribute to that term. I mean, think about it. What makes a hero? Someone who has overcome extreme odds to find success? Someone who has faced a difficult, life-altering challenge and not only survived, but even thrived on the other side? Who does that sound like? For those of you in severe benzo withdrawal, can you imagine a challenge harder than this one? And since we often look to heroes to guide us and inspire us in other aspects of our lives, shouldn't we do the same in benzo withdrawal? I, I'm not trying to put people on a pedestal, not in the least. We are all human and far from perfect. But perhaps it's not a bad thing to look to someone else, someone who has gone before you for a bit of inspiration and guidance. I think it's important to let yourself have a hero in your journey through benzo withdrawal. Find a story, perhaps a story like Baylissa's, or a story off one of the websites, or one of the success stories we share on this podcast where someone has made it, is healthy, is symptom-free, and is living a new life. It, it doesn't matter where you find this person. Just make sure it is a story of success, of where you want to be when this is all past. And trust me, there are plenty of those stories out there. You can find them. Perhaps even find multiple stories and carry them with you in, in your mind or on paper. It doesn't matter. And then when you get the temptation to go looking online for the bad, for more symptoms you may or may not have, for the messages of lost hope and struggle, and for, for the horror stories? Read these success stories instead. Let your hero guide you back and trust in her or his guidance. We share stories of all types on this podcast, and quite often they can be ones of struggle and distress. And we do so because we believe people have the right to have their story heard and because it often creates that connection that we often crave. But they are not the norm. And focusing on them too often skews our judgment. Letting our benzo-addled brain fuel itself with what might happen only leads to despair. Instead, fill your mind with positive stories from these heroes. The ones who have been through this before who found the rainbow on the other side and decided to write it down so that you might find something to cling to during this time. These are the stories of reality. They are not the stories of the extreme. They are the most common outcome from this experience. There are stories of all types out there. Why not cling to the good ones instead of the bad? You have to fight at times to lift your spirits during withdrawal. And reading, and even rereading over and over again a story of success just might help you get through all this. And at Benzo Free, we want to do whatever we can to help. So one of the things we're going to add in the next few months is, of course, our online Benzo stories. Now, yes, some of these will be the difficult stories, but I will make sure I separate, maybe even on a separate page, just success stories. So you can go to that page or even print off that page or even download the contents from that page. And it can be something you can go to often just to lift your spirits for a while. And not only do we need to look to others who are our heroes, but I think it's important to see ourselves that way. Remember, you are the hero of your own story, no one else. Benzo withdrawal can be a difficult journey for some. And you are the one doing it each and every day. You made it through yesterday, didn't you? Well, then congratulations. That is an accomplishment. Celebrate the little successes, the little accomplishments each and every day and build on them. You can do it. I know you can. You are my heroes. <laughs> I know that sounds trite to some of you, even insincere. Heck, 
I'm even having a hard time saying it because I know how it must sound. But there's truth in that. When I read your emails, your comments, and, and learn of what you deal with each and every day, and yet you get up the next day and do it again because you know someday this will ease, things will get better, and you'll be back even better than you were before. Well, that takes courage. That takes resilience, dedication. That takes heart. And I, for one, am proud of what you do every day. You are doing great, and you should be proud. I wish you all well today and every day. Today, we have a shortened format again. We will have our intro followed by our feature and close out with our moment of peace. Our normal format with our mailbag and Benzo story will return on February 12th. And our feature today is part two of our conversation with Baylissa Frederick. If you didn't hear part one of this conversation, you might want to go back and listen to that one first. I know you will enjoy the rest of our conversation with her. And of course, we still need feedback as always. Questions, comments, stories, suggestions, corrections, additions. This is your podcast. The more content I can share from you, the more Benzo Free becomes the community it was designed to be. So please tell us what you think. Visit our feedback at benzofree.org slash feedback or email us at podcast at benzofree.org or comment directly on the podcast blog post itself for others to see. And don't forget to sign up for our mailing list at benzofree.org slash subscribe. And one last thing, the Benzo Free Podcast is for informational purposes only and should never be considered medical advice. If you're listening to this podcast on one of our providers, please leave feedback on that carrier. This helps new listeners find us. Now let's move on to our feature. Our feature today is a conversation with Baylissa Frederick. This is part two of our two-part series with Baylissa. Today's episode was released on the same day as part one in case you didn't want to wait for both of them. If you haven't heard part one yet, you might want to back up and listen to that one first. I did share Baylissa's bio in part one of this series, so for today, let's just dive right in to the rest of our dialogue. You've taken a, and I'm sure this probably came also with your counseling background, but I really love your approach. Um, and it's an approach that I've kind of come into also just through my own experience and working mm -hmm. with different people. But the, the general approach of acceptance and of mindfulness and of of finding a more holistic way to work through this. Can you talk a little bit about your philosophy around that? Yes, certainly. Um, yeah, because one, one thing, when you, when you talked about um, what works, the, the most important thing in my experience with supporting people is acceptance. Yeah. I've seen the difference between someone accepting that, okay, this is a process I have to go through. The only way out is through versus mm -hmm. the person who fights every step of the way and how much additional emotional energy it takes for them to get through the withdrawal. So a mindfulness approach where they're able to observe what's happening. And it's not that they love it or, you know, they're sitting no. in Lotus, sort of drifting around in the sitting room, smiling. It's painful. It's scary. But there's an acceptance that this I'm going through this because I am healing, even if I don't feel like it. And so this not judging what's happening as, bad or yeah. awful it just is this needs to happen and almost being like that silent observer that silent witness watching what's going on and yes right. we may have reactions to certain things sometimes with the thoughts come feelings but not letting it consume you to the point where you know you f you forget what's really happening so people can, yeah. you know, there's this vicarious distress online where people get caught up in analyzing the symptoms and comparing and oh, scaring each other. And this one says to the other, oh, no, 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 you won't heal unless you do this. Or, you know, everybody goes to this amount of years exactly. and, and it causes yeah. so much distress. 
It really has. I'm corresponding right now with a person in Europe and who is in exactly that state that you're describing. And mm -hmm. I'm trying to nudge this person to say, you're making yourself progressively worse. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm trying not to, you know, of course, give them advice because I can't do that, but still say, look, you need to notice that being on the boards and looking up your symptoms and looking for all the details is actually helping to cause and mm -hmm. exacerbate your symptomology. But it's so hard for them to see that. I know. I think because there's this desperation and, you know, I was there myself, but I was the opposite. Um, when I, well, first of all, we didn't have Facebook, you know, so right. social media wasn't what it is today, but there was, I think, Benzo Buddies, um, Benzo Island, um, the Trap Forum, there were quite a few. Right. Yeah. And I went on to one. Um, and I spent, I think, a minute and a half because I You're went kidding. on and I saw the panic and I looked at maybe three or four posts and I thought, nope, never go. And I didn't go back. Oh. Now, I'm not saying to people, don't go online because for some people it's yeah. a lifeline. I'm just saying, please take a break, you know, like just yes. monitor how much time you spend and with whom and where you spend this time. And your reaction when you're online, how are you feeling afterwards? Exactly. Do you have you lost the will to live? Do exactly. not go back. <laughs> no, please don't. Please don't. And there's a, there's something to said about distraction and other things in life to keep you. If your mind yeah. is only on your symptoms, it it will overtake you. It will. And so any healthy distraction so not everybody, some people say I can't breathe or, you know, breathing doesn't work for me. But that that usually is because it's not done in a mindful way. Um, right. Because they're doing it and sort of monitoring and not allowing whatever the sensations are to just be. But, you know, that's okay. Mm -hmm. If something doesn't work for the person, don't do it. But there are many, many choices in terms of distractions that people can do. Some people say, yes. oh, but I can't watch TV. Maybe you can listen, you know, to podcasts, to audiobooks. Exactly. You know, there, there's so many things now. The world has changed and, you know, there's something for every everyone i agree you know their puzzles and word games and yeah there, there are so many tools out there and for me it was my recovery honestly was reading books and articles of course researching for the book i wrote was a big part of it but even after i still mm -hmm. right right now i am reading one of the dale carnegie's books yeah from 1944 yeah or how, how to stop worrying how to and start, start living, living yes. it. you know and uh, there's always a new book out there and through each one of those books i find at least one or two tips that i can mm -hmm. add to what i call my tool my toolkit or my toolbox yes, exactly it's just it's one of those things that's so hard for so many people but there are a lot of things to help there are. And I think the important thing is for people to experiment, explore, find what works yes. for them, because, you know, the whole no one size fits all. So something Absolutely. might work for one person, it doesn't for another. So the thing about healing from withdrawal is that it can be a great love affair with yourself. Yes. If, if, if the person really applies the mindfulness, the self-compassion, the nurturing, the, the healthy eating, the, the, you know, watching what you feed your mind, your brain, you know, Every dimension, every layer of healing, it can be one of the richest and most powerful and most beneficial life experiences, you know? I couldn't agree more. I agree. Mm -hmm. It was, and that's where I think, I think you, you mentioned this earlier and I had the same, I think, revelation, which is I am better off after this experience. I never want to go through this again, not in a million mm -hmm. years, but like any, I think, you know, try very trying situation in your life or like a near death experience or those types of things, we often come out stronger and with a different perspective. And yeah. I think that's it. And so I have an entirely different perspective now about life. 
Yes. And I am so much happier than I ever was before I even started taking these drugs. Yeah. And this is what everyone says. Everybody will say to me, Belissa, you were right. I am life exactly. is a walk in the park or, you know, even if things happen because they've been through something as challenging as, as withdrawal, you know, it's this feeling of near invincibility that nothing, you know, nothing can ever phase you. And it's really funny yeah. because the first person to say that I had written it in Benzo Wise and I was at mm -hmm. um, a, a, an expo in London trying to just get psychiatrists. It was a, it was actually a drug addiction um, expo, okay. but I wanted to bring in prescribed, you know, drugs. And I remember um, a psychiatrist walking up to me and he said, oh my gosh, a book on benzodiazepines. And then he said, I tell my patients going through withdrawal, when you get through this, nothing in life will ever phase you. And I, I said, here, take a copy. And I, I tried to get him to sort of speak out later on because we had exchanged right. numbers, but I think it was, you know, he couldn't jeopardize his practice and upset the apple cart, so he didn't. Yeah. You know, that brings us to a good topic, and that is kind of, you know, how are things going in the Benzo community, especially with awareness and research and, and outreach. Um, you, of course, are probably more aware of what's been happening in the United Kingdom, and in my opinion, the United Kingdom was kind of ahead of us in, in the U.S., in a lot of this, especially with um, Ashton and with Later and with some of the leaders you had. Um, also, yeah. I think the BMA is a little ahead of the of of our medical association and recognizing it. Um, where, do, where do you feel things are now? Do you feel like the progress is still moving forward? How do you think that's going? It is. And um, we do have Luke Montague and the right. Council for Evidence-Based Psychiatry. Yes. Uh, I mean, they have accomplished so much. We we do acknowledge the work of Barry Haslam, yes, McBean, the late McBean who died recently, um, Reg Pert and Colin Downs Granger and yes. Ray Nimmo, all these people. Ray was the first person to set up the Benzo.org.uk website, which of course brought the manual to so many people, including me. So. So they were the, the, you know, they were around for decades working and they did a lot of groundwork and, you know, Barry still does a lot of work. Yeah. Um, John, John Perrot was somebody else who was very involved. So they all did a lot. And then Luke came along and I remember him and he won't mind me saying this, you know, when he was in withdrawal saying, Belissa, when I'm finished, when this is over, I'm not going to stop. I'm going to make sure, you know, I promote awareness and do everything I can to help. And that's basically yeah. what he's done. He's through thick and thin. He's and what what he has, which is making things work, is that he will not um if they say, Oh, but we need the evidence. Luke will go and find the evidence. He'll go and put together a research team and get it and say, ah, here it is. So there's no way of getting rid of, because in the past, I think they would just make it difficult or as difficult as possible. Yeah. They can't do that with him. So I think, you know, the Council for Evidence-Based Psychiatry, they've, you know, up, um, things to do with the guidelines, guidelines for counselors. They've accomplished so much. A lot has been done. So it's maybe not going as quickly as we hope, but it's going. It's going somewhere in the right direction. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. One of the things I was going back to some of your stuff in, in your books that I was talking about, you mentioned something that I've talked about too. And until I read your book, I didn't know anybody else described it the same way, but it was the whole rational mind and kind of irrational mind. I yeah. mentioned a lot of times that in the middle of, you know, the worst stages of, of severe withdrawal that our irrational minds kind of take over, that emotional mind takes over and irrational minds are, are kind of pushed aside. And we need to find that and notice, notice that happening and also find that rational mind to help us be more logical and help get through this. You had talked a little bit about rational minds in your book. Could you talk a yes. little bit about that? Yes. Um, so when 
when in the throes of withdrawal and for someone who has very intense um you know the mental the psychological symptoms the looping thoughts and terror and so on there there are times when people will say to me oh Bela I, I went psychotic but I'll explain that no you haven't really gone psychotic because you wouldn't be able right. to tell me you went psychotic <laughs> you would not so and I, I point out that that's your rational mind noticing your reaction yeah. and remember that always so that you know that you're safe and your mind is sound however not always is a person able to cathect this rational mind when they're in the throes of an episode of, say, terror or, you know, whatever it is. So I always say to them, when there's always a space, a break in between, Yeah, that's when you, you just for a minute, you know, try to get back into that um, that I talked about the silent witness or the observer, which is what you use your rational mind to do. Yes. To to engage with. And so that's what you do. And then you remind yourself that this is not you. This is the drug. And that your rational mind, this is the reason people are able to say, oh, I hated when this happened because, you know, it's not like me at all. And I'll say, great, because it's not you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. exactly and you're noticing that i love that it's yeah it's not those i think you mentioned in your book it's when you have those under the blanket days i think is what you said when yeah. you have those days that are just really bad and you just can't get out of out of out of bed um and and your mind just takes over and, and the fear takes over and yes. you know i think the physiological damage and also some of the learning deficit that professor ashton talks about kind of kick in where we're just we can't handle those triggers like we used to at this state and thus that irrational brain just kind of kicks in and we get into that looping thinking yes. and we get into the ruminations and yeah. and that's what we talked about earlier where the distractions and finding something else and sometimes you know getting offline helps because we're just looking for more fuel to build our fear yeah and that's not helping anybody it isn't but the important thing is for them to do it with a mindfulness approach as in yes never try to distract to stop something from happening i agree yeah Thank you. because then it's not that's when people become a bit obsessed and then they're like oh let me go and play the, oh i play the game and it's still this bad and you know so yeah it's it's no i'm glad you mentioned that because that was one of the things I think one of the hardest things um, for me to, to hear, it's okay to feel the feelings. In fact, yes. it's good to. In fact, it's okay to dive into them and they're just feelings. Mm -hmm. And I just did not want to do that. I mean, that was so yeah. terrifying. Yeah. But once I started to, I it was brilliant. It was it just really helped me recover. I do you relate to that? 100% because what happens is you realize nothing is going to happen. You're not going to yes. die. You're not going to lose your mind. Even when somebody's, you know, having the panic and the terror and I'm like, okay, and what happened after that? And what happened after that? And they say, oh, well, it went away or it, it, I said, see, so nothing every day your brain is telling you your your withdrawal compromised brain is telling you you know all these catastrophes and Absolutely. threatening you with you know but nothing happens except it tells no. you these things so they're just it thoughts does. they're not your reality you know i know and that's that's mm -hmm. so hard to see when when you're in such a state of fear it is it really is. And so what I do a lot of the times is we do like a practice session. It's like okay. I call it anchoring. So they, they have like the anchor statements, something that they use that's attached to a feeling of safety and groundedness that it's, it's done in a preparation stage so that if the terror or any episode appears very suddenly they can just just maybe the use of a word will bring that anchor statement to the fore and they can use it right you know so that tends to work like we said earlier there's so many tools out there and you know they just need to try to, to uncover 
and cover them and, and find them and find the ones that work for them and work for, for each individual. Cause they are going to be different for each person. Yeah. I've had a lot of people who have said that they found a lot of help from their spirituality. And I, I say, that's wonderful. If you have that to count on, then, then use that, you know, then, then you, that it feels like you're not alone in this. Well, absolutely. I think for some people it's, does it's not appropriate. And so they have other sources of what inspires them and what connects them. But if you have a certain faith and a higher power, then great use that and know that that higher power is with you and helping you get through this oh yeah i mean i have people who you know they said they couldn't have healed without prayer and you know right. just sometimes looping gospel music and you know other people buddhist chants um you know that all sorts of you know in terms of spirituality yeah whatever works for the person exactly yeah it's like using all the resources available. There was a lady who had left an, a success story on benzo.org.uk and she was a counselor and she was on mm -hmm. clonazepam. And I printed her story. I had two success stories that I had printed off and folded up that I would read whenever I was, you know, close to despair. And I found that that rarely worked. And then I had my own, you know, I did a lot of EFT tapping because I'd been trained in EFT, you know, as a therapist in the earlier years. So I did my tapping. Um, I did all sorts of things. So that was my virtual toolbox in the sense of it. I didn't have a physical box with things. But some people then I encourage them to like put a journal and maybe a stuffed toy and photographs of right. their loved ones and, you know, anything that works, maybe their favorite um, DVDs, favorite music, you know, things like that. Just put them all in one place so that when they're having the worst days, when they can't even think, the box is just then they can just reach for it. Oh, that's great. I love that. I think for me, I was... Every time I saw a quote or something technique that I thought might help me, I just started, I would type it into my phone real quick or speak it yeah. into my phone or something. And then I wound up with a list. I think of right now I have about 235 tips in my toolbox Excellent. from all the different stuff I read. And I could just scroll through them and because each one is appropriate for a different situation. Yes. And so I scroll f through and find one that works for that because they don't always work for each situation. And I think having that variety of either positive messages or positive movies or whatever is going to help you work your way out of, you know, the depression is, is so mm. helpful during times like this, because we all are going to have those dark times. We do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't uh, read a lot. I went through a period of, you know, just cognitively, I couldn't, but yeah. I could listen. I listened to Eckhart Tolle a lot. Oh, I love him. Yeah, because yeah. I, you know, I do. And I found his energy very calming. So I just had him sort of on. I had an eight hour, I think it was, podcast. And I would just put it on. Sometimes had no clue what he was saying, but it was still comforting. And yeah. yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, I did a lot too. I had the, I came across the the book of joy, which just came out not too long ago, was um, one written about the last meeting of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Bishop Desmond Tutu. And because they were closest friends and their wisdom about how to find joy. Mm -hmm. And not only did I get the book, but I also bought a copy for a friend of mine and I got the audio book so I can listen to it when I want to. Yes. Because it, it always helps to have those kind of things as reminders. So I have that in my phone along with some Pema Chodron work, along with some some other spiritual stuff. And I listen to those periodically just to you know, help lift my spirits a little bit each day. Yes. And so this is where we um, withdrawal or any life challenge, if, if the right approaches are applied, can turn out to be blessings and just the best thing, yeah. things that set you up for the rest of your life. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. It's it's so hard. You had back up one second. You had mentioned EFT, emotional freedom technique, and the tapping. Yes. Can you maybe elaborate on that a bit? Yes. Yeah, so, well, just to say that the EFT, I 
when I did my training, Gary Craig, who was the developer of EFT, he invented EFT. Mm-hmm. Um, it was different then. I think people still use that technique where, you know, you go <laughs> and tap and look up to the left, look up yes. to the right. Uh-huh. But they're, they're, just to say, first of all, that there are many um, varied techniques in terms of the sequences that people use now. But EFT, it's, a, it's, it's similar to acupuncture in the sense that it okay. focuses on the meridian points or what, what we know as energy hot spots in the body. Mm-hmm. And it, it does that to restore balance and to restore energy. It is based on Chinese medicine. So okay. um, where, you know, the, the meridian points are... Uh, 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 re- are related to the way that the, the body flows, the energy flows through the body. Yeah. And so they bring balance. So EFT, um, you basically, you identify the issue that you want to work on. So it could be a symptom or, um, you know, anything. Some, if somebody isn't in withdrawal, it could just be, you know, maybe a relationship, anything. Okay. And you look for the the intense, so you sort of figure out what your intensity level is. So on a rate of zero to 10, with 10 being the most intense, how am I feeling? Then you start, you you start the... um, the sequence, but you usually you have like a setup. So it's like a phrase. So even though I have this terror, I deeply and completely accept myself or some people say deeply and completely love and accept myself or you know whatever the 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 setup statement is you have that ready and then you start your sequence so you're tapping on the meridian points while repeating this what what other um, techniques or tools do you use in your counseling like cbt or what other techniques do you use when you counsel patients yes um, i am trained in cbt um, so okay. I do use CBT. However, I do use it with the acknowledgement that there is a chemical or organic component to what's happening. So if someone has looping thoughts or, you know, intrusive thoughts, taboo thoughts, I wouldn't use an e- a CBT technique and then challenge them saying they aren't doing it properly and that's the reason they have the thoughts i would still offer them techniques but i would understand that the thoughts will persist or could persist because they're not you know of the rational mind they're like any other symptom like you know benzo belly or nerve pain or anything else caused by the same issue right um, let's talk about the medications themselves for a second. You talked about how you had originally written Benzo Wise and then, of course, went and rewrote the book, partly because mm-hmm. you wanted to include other drugs in addition to benzos. And you mentioned yes. in your book about how a lot of times SSRIs can have similar withdrawal experiences to benzodiazepines. Is that an, something you've seen in the patients you've worked with? Yes, 100%. Um, there's also a study by Nielsen at et al mm-hmm. showing that um the, the the reactions the withdrawal reactions of both groups of participants um out of i think it was 40 symptoms 37 shared the same symptoms my figures might be okay. a bit off but um basically there is no difference in terms of symptoms um, between antidepressants and benzodiazepines. There may be, I mean, I've found that people in antidepressant withdrawal may get maybe more zaps. There are a few subtle differences, okay. but um, in general, they're pretty much the same. And this is what people have reported anyway. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting. I was just reading that and I thought that was an interesting topic yeah. to bring up and, and discuss a little bit because I know some yeah. people, because benzodiazepines are often alerted as being one of the more difficult ones. And also it's one of the few ones that if you withdraw cold turkey can actually kill you, mm-hmm. um, much like alcohol withdrawal. But I don't know if that's the same exp- that, if that's the same issue with SSRIs or if they have the same effects on GABA that benzos do. 
or is it a different mechanism at play? Because I know it's more dopamine and... It's a difference. So the, the, the antidepressants will work on the 5-HT receptors and okay. the neurotransmitter is um, serotonin, whereas it's GABA and the GABA receptors for benzodiazepines. But I don't believe it's as simple as that. I don't know. I think science hasn't... The, the way it works and the way, you know, we know now that, you know, the gut is the second brain, that people have receptors yes, you know, throughout yes. the body. I think that's it's much, much more complex than that. I really believe that. And I think, you know, maybe when I'm dead and gone and, you know, in <laughs> decades or centuries to come, they'll know a lot more about what really happens. We know that there are genetic factors. There's so many variables involved in what a person experiences, you know? I, I totally agree. There are, and that's that's one of the things I think you and I both probably struggle with, especially when we're trying to help other people, is I think most people want to focus on one thing. But there are so many variables. Like somebody might say, uh, I, I messed up and I, you know, I had a drink last night. Or... Um, I did this or whatever, but they're not also figuring out, okay, that happened, but also you had the anxiety about it. Also, you had a fight with your spouse the night before. Also, you overate too much sugar. Also, exactly. you know, there's, there's so many, yeah. So it's like, it's so hard to identify. I found that in my experience was that it's hard to identify the actual trigger of a wave of symptoms. Well, I just say to people, we, you never know. And I think I can be a little bit annoying because I'm very vague and people don't understand it's because I, I actually, they think I'm not scientific, but it's because <laughs> I'm scientific that I know that you can't just, you know, association doesn't mean causation. So, right. you know, you can eat exactly. something that's maybe high glutamate or you know, but you don't know if how you felt after was that or something else. You know, there's so many things to be considered. So I just say to people, well, you know, I don't know. Um, I always say I don't know. And they're like, what? You don't know? I, I do have the same problem. <laughs> and I also have, often have to say, well, I can't advise you on some of this stuff, especially on if somebody asks me, how should I taper? I have to say, well, I can't tell you that's between you and your doctor. And mm -hmm. if you want to refer to the Ashton manual, that's probably some of the best, you know, resource to go to. But what, what, what type of things do you come across when you deal with your patients? I know you work with a lot of patients online and what yeah. kind of limitations do you have? You of course have a psychotherapy experience and, and a degree, but do you find limitations in things that you, areas you can't help them with? Yes. So um, as a therapist, I can't give my clients any sort of tapering advice. I can't comment right. on any medical treatment they're getting, um, which I understand. It's not my remit and I'm not trained sure. to do it. So, But we're more at um, risk of being sued than, say, somebody in a group who or an administrator okay. who give, who can give this advice. So... Um, I mean, of course, if somebody says, oh, I just stopped all the pills yesterday or, you know, they've gone cold turkey immediately, um, it's like, no, 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 please, you know, so yeah. things like Hang that. on a second, yes. hang on a second. Back at, yeah. So, and yes, I do refer them. I do give them information, but I can't say do this or do that. And yeah. it's, it's so funny because even if somebody goes on to one of the big groups and they'll say, oh, Bayless or Frederick told me, everybody say, no, she didn't. Because I tried <laughs> yeah. to get her. They to know you too them. well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of good to know. But there was, just so you know, there was a therapist who got sued by a doctor because she told someone the taper was too rushed. Yeah. Yeah. They can get in trouble. In fact, I think my listeners have gotten really tired of hearing me say, oh, and by the way, I do need to remind everybody that this is not medical advice. I am not a medical professional and I can't provide any professional advice in any matter. Yes. I think I say that about two or three times every episode. Plus, I have my disclaimer plus because because I can't yeah. and I can never presume to be. I'm just a person. I don't even have you know a, a therapy degree or a master's. So I'm just somebody who can share my experiences. But that's that's the biggest, that's the most important qualification, though, Dee. 
you know, having been through it yourself. So don't don't downplay or, you know, underestimate your contribution. Well, thank you. So that's one thing. The other thing is sometimes people, there are people online who maybe share their story, but they don't put everything. And because of confidentiality, I see people freaking out. I can't say anything. So there are people yeah. who... Maybe they're still taking another drug, but they'll say some, and they do it with me too. They'll book a session and they'll say, I've been in withdrawal for eight years. And then when they're about down, they'll say, um, I think I'll maybe start tapering off the Valium soon. Oh no. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but they don't say it online. So right. people freak out about these stories and, they don't have all the facts or maybe the person exactly. you know, was, you know, maybe a heavy pot smoker for five, the first five years or, yeah. you know, so th that's quite challenging for me because here I am dealing with someone who is suicidal because of a false story. Yes, exactly. Exactly. You know, I, so. I know what you're talking about and it's so sad because you're right. It's, I think it's the hopelessness that people get trapped in the middle of this and then they read the horror stories and they, they pick out the worst story mm -hmm. and they know that's going to be them. Yes. And it's not. <laughs> I know. No, but the withdrawal brain hooks it. You know, it it's does. in fight, flight, or freeze mode and every perceived threat becomes a reality. Yeah. You know? It does. Yeah. And that's, that's that we need to, like you said, we need to notice that rational mind when it kicks in and listen to it. And, realize yes. okay i'm i'm not processing information optimally right now and and yes. so i need to notice that and pull back and let that observer self you know watch this and see that happening and say okay that's not real yeah. that's just me freaking out <laughs> you know exactly it's just a thought it's not my reality exactly. i do exactly. not have to believe it so before we close out here, I would like to talk a little bit about um, your website and your services. I know you have a website um, at baylissa.com, which is Bloom and Wellness, and you do the newsletter and you have um, groups. Could you talk a little bit about what you provide? Yes, yeah, sure. So I, I started Bloom and Wellness literally just to have somewhere safe for people who weren't really. There's some people who want things sort of filter they just want to focus on healing so this was why I started it um, they are you know we do talk about symptoms but we only do that in our Q&A session okay so every Monday we have a Q&A session for the UK US you know the, the the northern hemisphere and every Tuesday morning we have for Australia you know Japan and um, New Zealand and the Southern Hemisphere. Right. And that's when we talk about symptoms. Apart from that, I do webinars, I do workshops. Um, we, we offer like a hangout. So there's a chat room where members go, they're all on Zoom. Okay. And they see each other and spend time together. And to be honest, sometimes they're on for like five hours. Um, <laughs> Yeah, four or five hours, people yeah. come and go. And it's really lovely for the people who are isolated. Sure, it would be. That would um, be wonderful. Yeah, so we have the hangouts, and that's you know quite a few times per week. Um, what you refer to as a newsletter, that's a daily message okay. that comes to their inbox every morning. And it's just a message asking them to, you know, hold on and, you know, just um, a message of hope. It, it is. And it's such, such calming message, especially when you're having a more chaotic day or a difficult day. You can pull up that, like I get that email come in and I can look at that and it's like, okay, I can take a step back and I can, I can pull back a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, people love it. And I do it audio and written. So some people say, oh, I just listen to that throughout the day to remind me. So I think it's working. Oh, that's and great. then we just have, you know, the symptoms, information, um, coping tools, tons of hundreds of videos, um, things like um, 
meditations, mm -hmm. affirmations. It's it's all it can almost be information overload, but it's just that, you know, people pay twenty pounds, so they pay five pounds a week okay. to have access to all of this and Oh yeah, that's not bad. No, I tried. To, well, that's it, because I couldn't spread myself any thinner in terms of, you know, the demand. Right. I just thought, what can I do for, you know, that anyone can have access? But it's not something I could have done for free because I do like a Vimeo um, yeah. You know, the, the platform, which is everything I do, I have to do with premium. So yeah. the Zoom and it, it costs, my, it's expensive. <laughs> yeah. It's very expensive. And because I have to have an IT, there's always a glitch. Right. You know, and some, so I have an IT guy sort of on call. Yeah. Who I have to pay, <laughs> you know, by the hour. And yes. Oh, I've, I've, I've had this, I've had the same issues. Um, in fact, I'm still figuring out my, my um, revenue stream to keep this going because for podcasting servers, yeah. for other servers, for online sound bites, for all these different things, for software, um, for recording yeah, software, for up. equipment. Yeah, it just, mm -hmm. it does add up. And, and of course, this has become my full-time job. So, you know, I've had a lot of opposition because I did everything for free yeah. from 2006 to 2014. When I started charging, and this was because I was going to be homeless, because nobody, exactly. because I'd spoken out, nobody would employ me. Oh, no. I'm was, so sorry. Yeah, I was branded the crusader. Oh. So I was going to be homeless. I yeah. had to find a way to look at And I thought, look, you have a master's degree. You're a therapist. Just offer therapy. But yeah. there was a lot of, you know, bailiffs taking money from sick people and people arguing in groups. And then they'd say, but so do you go to your doctor and get it for free? And, you oh, know, it was know. a nightmare. Oh, I'm so sorry but... that happened to you. It's a, it's such a shame it's when you're okay. when you're really trying to help people. But I, I think that's the hard part is people, I think, sometimes forget that, you know, we're both we both went through this too and are now trying to, you know, help out. But I, I, like you, it's like my wife has been the financial provider for years now because of my, you know, debilitation during this. And now that I'm coming back to it, I'd like to keep doing what I'm doing, but I also yeah. need to contribute to our mortgage and to our, our heat and to food. And, yes, exactly. But I'm, I'm glad that you have your site and I think it's a wonderful resource. I'm so happy that you're, you, you stuck it out. And even through Thank all you, you went through, you stayed around because I can tell you this, I do get many emails where people have said, oh, when I talked to Baylissa and she really helped me out here, or, oh, by the way, I was, I was on, you know, Bloom and Wellness the other day and she mentioned this and this really got me through. I, I just want to share with yeah. you that I've seen that so many thank times you. from those emails. So thank you for all you do. Thank you. People who can't sleep will say, I just listened to your webinars all night. Or they'll say, my Good. husband has to listen to you all night. And, <laughs> you know, things like that. You know, I couldn't be happier in terms of the fulfillment yeah. that comes with it. We have the um, Positive Pastimes Facebook group, and that's where people hang out right. and share their healthy distractions. Oh, that's as great. Well. So it's great. Uh, I'm so I'm so I'm so happy and I'm so happy to have had a chance to speak with you today. Thank you so much for taking your time to talk with me today, Belissa. Oh, thank you too, Dee. And it's lovely to, you know, get to know you a bit better and thank you for everything you do. Oh, okay? thank you. I appreciate it. Well, you have a good day. Thanks, and the same to you. I sincerely want to thank Belissa for spending her time with us and for all she has done over the years supporting the Benzo community. Speaking with her is so relaxing and uplifting, just the type of inspiration we all need during this difficult time. I've left links to her site and books in our show notes, and I've added her information to the resource section of our website. Thank you, Baylissa, and I hope to hear you back on the podcast real soon. And now, before we get to our moment of peace, please allow me just 30 seconds for our disclaimer. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice in any way. The host of this podcast is not a medical professional, nor is he engaged in rendering medical, health, or psychological advice, nor any other kind of personal or professional services.
The views and opinions expressed by our listeners and interview guests on this podcast, whether read from textual submissions or presented in their own voice, do not necessarily reflect those of the Benzo Free Podcast or of its host. Withdrawal tapering or any other change in dosage of benzodiazepines, non-benzodiazepines, or any other prescription drugs should only be done under the direct supervision of a licensed physician. Our full disclaimer can be viewed on our website at benzofree.org slash disclaimer. And that brings us to our closing, our moment of peace. It's just one minute, and it's an opportunity to quiet your mind a bit before you return to the chaos of the real world. The way this works is that I will give a brief introduction, perhaps a suggestion of something to focus on. Then I will play a soft bell which will indicate the start of the one minute. This will be followed by another soft bell which will indicate the end of the one minute. And that will be the end of the episode. Feel free to continue to meditate if you choose. If not, continue on with your day. Please remember that you should only do this if you are in a safe place where you can close your eyes, relax, and let the world pass by without you for a minute. Today we are going to try something different. Every now and then I like to introduce a new style of meditation so we have a variety of styles to choose from. And as always, if this one doesn't fit you, then please feel free to do one of your favorites. Today we are going to introduce Tratika, or gazing meditation. It is a yogic meditation technique. This one starts with your eyes open. Fix your gaze on an object, like a candle or a sacred image. Focus on this object and only this object. Then, after a few minutes, you will close your eyes, but keep the image of the object in your mind's eye. If your mind wanders, gently bring it back to the image of the object. Let's get started. Find something to focus on and relax. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second and let it out slowly. Let's do that again. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second and let it out slowly along with all the stress of the day. One more time. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second. Then let the breath out slowly, relaxing your entire body. Now just breathe slowly and naturally and close your eyes, but keep the image of the object in your mind. If your mind wanders, just gently bring it back to this image. No judgment. Continue to do this for one minute.
our next episode is episode 56 and it will be released in two weeks thank you again for joining me today and please let me know how we did keep calm taper slowly and take care of yourself I'll see you next time.